Good morning. If everyone in the room can start taking their seats, we're ready to get started. Good morning, hello and welcome. My name is Katie Gardner. I'm director of events for The Hill. And on behalf of The Hill and our partners at the Bipartisan Policy Center, thank you all for joining us this morning for an incredibly timely discussion. Increased severe weather, evolving customer needs, new advancements in technology and global conflict all continue to transform how energy is provided to households and businesses. In recent weeks, we've seen alarming headlines from around the country, heightening concerns about the security and resiliency of our critical infrastructure. And today we'll focus specifically on cyber and climate solutions to bolster the power grid. I'd like to thank our partners, the Bipartisan Policy Center for their support in putting this program together and for hosting us here today. In addition to our guests in the room, we're live streaming on thehill.com. A few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. Please keep your phones on silent for the duration of the program, but we do encourage you to join the conversation on social media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Hill Events, and we'll be using the hashtag, hashtag The Hill Energy. And with that, it's now my pleasure to welcome our first guest this morning. Poosh Kumar is the Director of the Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response at the Department of Energy. As electricity becomes a more critical need in winter, a growing number of reported threats to power infrastructure are under investigation following attacks on substations, most recently in Moore County, North Carolina. Poosh's department is tasked with responding to these types of emergencies. Welcome, Poosh and The Hill's contributing editor, Steve Clements. Thank you very, very much, Katie. First of all, I say it's great to see all of you, and I want to just congratulate Jason Grummet and the uh, uh, entire team at Bipartisan Policy Center, uh, and also The Hill, which does you know, outstanding programs. It's a real honor to be here. Hey, let's start out with some fun. We were just talking, before we get into the serious stuff and you know, all the cyber threats and Star Wars, et cetera, um, the Department of Energy building kind of sucks. You know, and if you go there and you sort of think about energy resiliency and clean energy and kind of coming, at, is there any chance at all under your tenure there that we can come up with a new design and something that's a bit more attractive and yields more power than it uses and, and is fully secure? You know what, I, Steve, well, first, first and foremost, it's great to be here and I, I love the opening question. Um, you know what, I feel like this is the organization that could potentially help us make a change. In the building, um, I know it's been I something. I think we should elevate it above <laughs> replacing the FBI building. Listen, right? you know, so. listen. When it comes to law enforcement, I always let them go first. Yeah. So we're going to go with the FBI first, then we'll tackle the building at DOE. But guess what? We just installed a number of EV chargers at the department, so that's really exciting. Oh. Um, so that we actually are able to bring in some of the EVs into the department as well. So that's well, that's exciting. that's terrific. That's yeah. a little progress there. But let me ask you to get to the to the real issue today: is to look at the security of the provision and, and, and distribution of energy in this country, transmission, et cetera. And this is what you've been focused on on cyber. And you made a comment recently that, that I found very compelling. It said we have a really once in a generation or even more chance to begin building in security rather than bolting on security. So tell us more about that. That's, that's a great question, Steve. Um, you know, from my vantage point, we are at an unprecedented point in America's energy transition. Um, we're looking at decarbonization, um, and we're looking at shifting to this renewable energy that we're going to be integrating into the U.S. electricity sector. Mm -hmm. um, we're not only doing that, so we're seeing a shift in um, not only decarbonization and shifting to, to clean energy, but there are a couple of other shifts that are happening right now. Um, the second shift that I see that's happening is a technology shift. Mm -hmm. So we're using new technology to make the grid more reliable, more safe, um, improve the operational efficiency of the electric grid. Um, and then number three, um, we're also seeing how consumers are having their own transition. Consumers want to be more interactive with their grid. They want to plug in their electric vehicles, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. They want to install solar panels. They want to have those Nest thermostats that control um, their energy usage. So you're seeing not only the climate shift, you're seeing the uh, tech shift, and then you're seeing consumer shifts. All of these things are happening. 
Um, and then we're also seeing a shift in risks to the energy sector, risks from cyber, uh, risks from physical, as we saw with the North Carolina incident. Um, but we're also seeing- So just tell for our viewers who may not be, they're tuning in from California right now, what was the North Carolina incident? Let's sure. make, add a little drama here. All right, me. so, so um, uh, to, this, not this past week, in the previous weekend, you had an incident where someone um, shot at a substation with and guns. With guns. Not bows and arrows. No, right? no, no, yes. with guns um, in, in, in Moore County in North Carolina, um, which resulted in about 40,000 customers being without power. Hmm. Um, so, so you had this physical security incident. And then one of the biggest things that we're seeing is in change in climate, which is actually the result of climate change, is having more wildfires, more severe hurricanes. So all of these things are happening all at the same time. And so really... What do we do about all this? Mm -hmm. And so, from my again, from my perspective, so, we can so either not worry. To but those are physical exogenous shocks to systems that shut them down. What about internal exogenous shocks? You know, in terms of malware, cyber sabotage, yep. and and those dimensions of security as well. And it occurs to me, and it's something that's really irking me right now, that we mark the invasion of Ukraine as February twenty fourth when tanks rolled in. But the first cyber war against Ukraine began on February 23rd. Microsoft has a great report on this. And it's interesting how we're so oriented towards a physical assault, like a gun attack. But I think many people are unaware of the fragility on the cyber front. I, I would actually go farther back. Um, the first cyber incident you saw in Ukraine was 2015. Yes, well. Right, 2015 right. that took down the power, right. and then 2016 right. that took down the power. Right. Uh, so we've been seeing this for a while, and we've been seeing that that is also a very real threat mm -hmm. um, as we think of the electric sector and what do we learn from there to apply to what we need to be doing here mm -hmm. in the United States. Now, you have um, been a champion of the Clean Energy Cybersecurity Accelerator. Yes, Tell us what that is, and is it fun? <laughs> I, I, I think it's fun, but I'm also a geek. So mm -hmm. um, what we really wanted to do was really bring together the clean energy community with the cyber technology community. Right. And so what we were able to do was use one of our labs, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory um, out in Denver, Colorado. And if you've ever been to their campus, they have solar, wind, batteries, EVs, all connected in a grid environment. And what we were able to do was leverage that environment and then bring tech cyber technology vendors to say, how would you protect this? What kind of tools and technologies could you apply to this environment to now protect a very different architecture that's gonna be required for this clean energy economy. And so we brought them all and we're now actually conducting tests of different cyber technologies to really secure um, clean energy systems going into the future. And we're gonna continue doing this. We just announced our first cohort um, a couple weeks ago. Um, it's publicly on our website and we're gonna to continue to bring in more cyber tech vendors to help be part of the solution of securing the grid of the future. You know, I'm a regular consumer of bipartisan policy center reports because they take complex things and they put it in lay language that someone like me can understand. Um, one of the gaps that's still out there for me is understanding how the Inflation Reduction Act and the investments in clean energy and cybersecurity and grid and all the different layers and dimensions is going to reach people. And we can get lost in numbers sometimes. And I'd just love to ask you to talk to us from a security perspective what are the most important elements of the Inflation Reduction Act and the opportunities there? And then maybe the real sexy part of this would be, what did they screw up on and not fund that they need to? Um, so, so we actually know it was the Inflation Reduction Act was yeah. certainly a really important um, piece in terms of the clean energy, shift to clean energy, um, with a lot of the tax credits that are in the, in the right. um, IRA. But there's also the in, um, um, infrastructure bill, the President's Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, which is already there, funded out there. Correct. Moving. Both of those are being worked right now. So in the infrastructure law, the DOE has over $62 billion to execute over the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, Inflation Reduction Act also gets to really fuel the uh, clean energy economy more on the tax credits and um, side of things and loans uh, right. from the department. Um, so we have an opportunity where we're deploying a lot of this funding out there. How do we bake in, as you started, security and resilience. So as we're deploying these new tools and technologies, our focus in my office, Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, Emergency Response, or CSER, mm -hmm. um, is to work with all of those other offices 
so that we have cybersecurity requirements mm. into these new technologies. Also, as we think of these different risks that we were just talking about, how do we really rethink communities? How do we really build in resilient communities? How do we use microgrids and battery storage so that we can actually think of these different risks and then work with the utilities and work with solar wind companies and battery companies to say, how do we really build resiliency into all of it? And so all of this combined is really going to be really do a game changer. You, do you folks hire hackers to attack your own systems to see how well you're doing? So, so hacker um, has a negative uh, connotation. Um, just the term hacker, you know, of course, there's... I look at it as someone with a specific skill set. And, and yeah. so, so, the, so there are white hat hackers right. okay. that, that, are the, that, are the, that are the good guys that are trying to hack your system but to I mean, help I'm you understand. But I'm not asking you specifically. I mean, Tom Fanning yeah, is yeah. going to be speaking with uh, Jason in a minute, you know, has, has shared with me in the past at Southern Company that literally, I don't know if the number is millions or tens, but I mean, the number of assaults each day that the grid, that, that the major utilities and providers are getting is just an astronomical number. So... You know, if you're a company with a, a, a strong degree of, I guess, hygienic approaches to protection when it comes to cybersecurity, but what if you're a weak link in that process? And I guess that's why I'm interested in the hackers is when you're kind of looking at the layers that we need for security, are we testing our own blind spots in okay. some way? And, and, and so we have to be. Hmm. So there are a number of cyber um, adversaries out there, right? There's nation states. Um, there's the big four that we always talk about, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. But we also have ransomware hackers, as we saw with the Colonial Pipeline right. attack, um, which are criminal groups. Mm. So we really do have to be thinking about the cyber risk, which is increasing every day. And so to that end, um, where we are focused is there's a lot of them out there. So there needs to be a lot of us working together on the defense side. And so we're working on a concept that I, I, I don't know if Tom's going to get to, but he's actually been um, uh, instrumental in, which is really joint operational collaboration. We need industry and government working more closely than ever before mm. on cybersecurity. We, we can't just do it in our own silos. We have to work together. And so um, we at the department are looking at a new concept called the Energy Threat Analysis Center. Um, we want to bring together... Um, electric utilities, pipeline operators, and other energy companies working with us at the department, working with us um, on the intelligence side, and then working in partnership with our sister agencies at DHS. So the ETAC, or the Energy Threat Analysis Center, is going to be connected to the big DHS Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, or the JCDC. And really the idea is we have to take a whole of government approach working with our partners at DHS, the other agencies, and with our intelligence community to really get ahead of these cyber threats mm. and do it collaboratively. Because there's, like you said, there's a lot of cyber um, 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 worries out there. And, but I also think the way we approach it here in the United States has actually proven to be um, um, better, but we need to continue doing more as we see the threats increase. And where are we on permitting reform at this point not just the legislation that Joe Manchin has been pushing, but the broad process. Because as I understand it, we have you know, wind farms in places that are far away from customers. And one of the deficits we have there is grid infrastructure that can connect real big renewable outlets to these opportunities. And folks don't want this stuff in their backyard. So how do we um, change the environment in such a way that we're not necessarily abrogating the concerns of people who have you know, real important environmental impacts, but we, you know, turn it from being a decade-long process into a couple-of-year process. You know, I, I know there are a lot of really smart people at the department really working with it on this issue. And, and with my former background being an electrical engineer and working on electric utility, I know this is a really key piece to the puzzle, right? It's being able to connect a lot of the clean energy resources. We need the transmission lines to connect all this together. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to take a lot of engagement. And so we, where we are focused as a department is we recognize that certainly from a federal level, we can work on the policies, we can work on the funding, but ultimately this becomes a local and state issue as well. So we have to work with those communities. And so we as a department, and I, I can't take credit for this in Caesar, but other parts of the department are really focused on working with, with those communities mm -hmm. and really engaging with communities to truly to help them understand the, the value in what we are trying to do. Um, and I think ultimately, um, you're going to see a shift. You're going to see a shift where communities are going to recognize 
how powerful this can be, not for only the clean energy economy, but also to add that resiliency that we need yeah. into the well, grid. Well, I may get, I may ask a totally uninformed question here, so let's get it right. But I watched the, the Telecom Act divide essentially the infrastructure holders from a lot of people who use the lines. And, you know, the Googles and the data, you know, big data players came on and used facilities that are, and you have these battles, you know, over net neutrality, et cetera. Is there anything like that in the energy space where there's tension between the grid, the transmission lines, the people and institutions that own the infrastructure and deregulating that so that lots of other players can use it and having essentially an unfair, uh, or actually not unfair, uh, you take the morality out, the uneven uh, sharing of the burdens or, or opportunities of that. Is there a similar construct that we need to begin thinking about in the energy space that we had to wrestle through on the telecommunication space? I, I think you're seeing it play out right now. Hmm. Um, I, I think that you're seeing a lot of different market players that are entering into the energy sector that we haven't seen before, and it's only going to be accelerated and which through side some of the investments. Win? And which sides should win? And the reality is we all need to win if we're actually going to be really looking at the, the threats of climate change, and we're going to be looking at the threats of cyber. We can't do it alone. So we have to be able to each leverage our own uh, capabilities, our own authorities, to really come together to really think about what is good for the U.S. economy, the U.S. national security. And we need to think about all those factors. And that, that's not easy to do, but it will take not only state and local uh, folks, federal. It's going to take all the different energy market players coming together. And so I think we are headed there, and it's actually a very exciting time for us right now. I want to go to the <clears throat> audience and take a couple of quick questions. But um, before doing that, I wrote a piece recently um, where I had a little bit of a scoop that President Biden was really worried about your arena, that, that he said it wasn't the fact that we didn't have enough energy stockpiles for ourselves or our allies, or that you know in this time where a lot of energy has been weaponized that we don't have. Now, there, it's, it's distribution. It's another colonial pipeline incident. It's, a, it's an accident or something that may disrupt uh, the systems. And we've talked a little bit about that. But I guess in, in your conversations, and you know, on, on top of this, is how, I mean, on a scale of 1 to 10, where are we broadly in your profile of, 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 of dealing with President Biden is worried about? And, and as we go through winter, making sure that we don't have any more disruptions to energy supply. Absolutely. So like we started, we have a number of risks that we're challenged with. It's, it's, it's the risks of climate, it's the risks of cyber, it is this physical risks. Mm -hmm. And the reality is we have to really balance all these risks and start to decide how do we tackle them. And it, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't say it's easy. But I will say this is a real focus of our office. Um, we are focused singularly on the fact that there are these different risks and how do we really inject security and resilience and reliability into these conversations. Um, again, I think we can do it all, I, but, but we have to be very intentional about it. We have to actually be focused and really have those difficult conversations of when are we adding to the reliability? How do we design the system differently? And for my time at the Department of Energy, and I get to really meet some of the smartest scientists and engineers in the world at the national laboratories, I really think we can do it. And I think the sector is ready to do it. So um, it's going to take all of us having that conversation. And one quick, you know, we just had this fusion announcement. I guess the sector is going to be talking about that at 10 o'clock or may have, you know, may have already done that. Um, I was at that facility 40 years ago, and it was one of the largest, coolest facilities. I guess I couldn't talk about it, or I was told not to talk about it, or I would be ended. Um, but it was an enormous, I mean, it looked like a movie set of something. And, and, and for something to happen that's so small, I mean, is, is this significant, what just happened? This is huge. Um, you know, we've been talking about fusion for a very long time as a country, and to actually have ignition is a huge breakthrough. There's certainly more we need to be doing, but the announcement today that, that did go out earlier today, right, um, by the secretary, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Why did they fail for 40 years? <laughs> Listen, I'm going to leave that question to okay, all the really okay, smart great. scientists okay, back great. at the lab. <laughs> all right, I've got. I know Phil Sharp in here has a question. Oh, here he is, uh, former Congressman Phil Sharp. Phil, thank you. Uh, 
First of all, very impressive uh, what you're doing and how you articulate it. My question is uh, to follow up on Steve's, which is about this winter where NERC has put out a, uh, their assessment for the winter supply of electricity and claiming that in New England and Midwest and in Texas there are risks that they could come up short. I don't uh, know to what degree your office gets drawn into that or whether you advise the EPA. And is NERC on, just for the, our viewers Oh, online? the National uh, Electric Reliability Council. So it's, it's a not formal the government Re entity. Regulatory Commission, it's the National so you got to clarify these things. Electric yeah. Reliability Council. Okay, great. Thank you. And Bill. it now has power, or the FERC has the power to force utilities. So do you to worry act. about shortages? So you know, when we think of the the, the New England area in particular, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and we are we are involved. So we are working with all the New England states um, to really think through and prepare for um, you know potential um, challenges in the New England area. The good news is um, the the market operator. ISO New England actually put out an assessment um, a couple of weeks ago saying they're expecting that they will have enough capacity in the region, which is, which is great news. Um, but again, this is another area where we really need to think about what are the other opportunities to bring in energy into that community or into that region more broadly um, so that we can get ahead of this. And again, can we build in back to the resiliency piece? Can we build in resiliency um, and really think about connecting um, other resources into the community. If we are okay this winter, then we have another year. Let's work towards it. And so that's going to be our focus. It's going to be our focus and working with other offices at DOE and the states um, to do just that. But we're absolutely involved, and it's a really important issue to talk about. Thank you. And right here, is it Susan? Yeah, Susan, Susan. Morrow with Exelon. Quick question for you on the whole of government point that you were making. When you think about a lot of DERs being out there, the Electric sector's reliance on telecom is just going through the roof, and we're all looking at investing significantly potentially in the next few years in telecom assets to back getting all that data flow. And I'm wondering, I mean, what's the interaction between DOE and FCC? Because we have challenges on spectrum. We have challenges on different standards for restoration and resiliency with telecom versus the electric sector. Is there a conversation going on there? Because it And I didn't even to plant be. that question. It's totally cool. Uh, it, 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 is a, it is a great question because the reality is to actually make all of this work, different systems need to be able to talk to each other, mm -hmm. which is where the comms comes in. And so we have to be thinking about how does the, the connection between um, electricity and comms work out um, and, and, of course, other sectors. And so we are working with them. Um, we need to continue working with them more closely um, to address whether it is spectrum issues or whether it is how do we go and deploy more fiber out there to be able to connect these different resources. Um, this is a really important conversation, and um, we're having it within um, the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council um, that, that Tom Fanning used to co-chair. Um, we were already having those conversations where we need to bring in the communications companies to really think through um, the future of the grid as it connects to comms. Um, and so that's going to be a continuing conversation. And yes, I'm glad you raised it. Let me just finish this up with a question. You know, I'm interested, every presidential administration has a different relationship with the business sector. Sometimes they're very robust, sometimes they're lean. I'm interested in your view, because you've been on both sides of that equation, on what you think the business sector needs to do better than it's doing today to be a better partner with what you're trying to achieve. So. Uh, I appreciate that question. Um, I would say, I, I, so within the electricity sector, I actually think it's a model sector for other sectors. So there's 16 critical infrastructure sectors out there, as designated by the Department of Homeland Security. The electricity sector is the only one that has CEOs who meet with senior government officials, so the Deputy Secretary of Energy, Secretary of Energy, um, White House, uh, the Department of Homeland Security. The, and the, it is the only sector that does that right now. Um, we meet together to think through policy when it comes to security, resilience, and we work on those policies. We may not always agree on how to do it, but we're having the difficult conversations, which is really um, pushing the ball forward on the climate side, on the cyber side. Um, we really need to bring in some of the other sectors to have those same conversations. Back to the question of comms, we need some of the comms CEOs to be part of these conversations. And so that's what I would say is you need to have leadership coming in, working closely with government, and not being um, um, resistant to that, to saying we have to work together and it has to come from the top. 
Well, Puesh Kumar, Director of the Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response at the Department of Energy, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, and thanks for sharing your thoughts as well on the future of that DOE building and what we might do. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks, thank Steve. you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you both. And we'll see Steve again a little bit later, but now help me welcome Jason Grume, founder and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center. He's joined by Tom Fanning, chairman, president, and CEO of Southern Company, and an internationally rec respected voice on energy innovation, economic growth, and cybersecurity. <laughs> Tom served as a member of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, the bipartisan panel established to study policy solutions to prevent and prepare the U.S. against cyber attacks. Tom, good to see you and uh, your cup of tea, which is a little bit off brand in my um, perspective. <laughs> so just want to kind of anchor this discussion to get started. You know, the Bipartisan Policy Center always tries to kind of understand our history while reaching for the future. So to, to start with history, so one of the most consequential events in American energy policy happened 43 years ago when there was a really tragic nuclear accident at Three Mile Island. The second most consequential thing that happened that year was that Tom Fanning joined the Southern Company. <laughs> and just to put this in a little historical context, other thing that happened that year, the United States developed full diplomatic relations with China for the first time. The Shah of Iran was deposed. Sony came out with the Walkman. And if you were listening to that Walkman to hear the top song, you would be listening to Reunited by Peaches and Herb. <laughs> it is nice to be reunited with you, Tom. We will leave it to the audience to tell us whether it feels so good or not. Um, all right, so a little more seriously, this is a conversation about resilience and innovation. I want to get your thoughts, reflective thoughts on some of the big picture issues, talk about incentives. I'm guessing the word market design comes up a little bit of cyber, a little bit of question about just how the public and private works together. So how long do we have? We have like 45 minutes, and that means I have like two questions for you. Um, <laughs> all right. So, that was insensitive. So look, resilience <laughs> is about withstanding and recovering. Innovation is about disruption and advancement. Yeah. How are we going to withstand, disrupt, recover, and advance in the energy sector? The all theory the same of time? creative destruction. Okay. Uh, Say more. You know, so the greatest harbinger of future failure is past success. And so if you're successful in kind of a vein of activity, then uh, you tend to get addicted to the way we did things yesterday. And this idea of intentional creative destruction, you always have to have systems that attack conventional wisdom. And I think in this industry where for now over 100 years we've had this dogma of make, move, and sell with central station facilities. Uh, now as technology advances, as the market and customer requirements change, we really do need to think differently about this interconnectedness and how we're going to make it work in the future, which does attack the conventional wisdom. And think about how many billions, if not trillions, of dollars have been invested in the old way. And so how do we move people to the new way? And then picking up on the conversation that Clemens and, and Puch just had. Uh, value is a function of risk and return. And there's this dogma that surrounds the idea that return is the analog in this reference would be to keep costs low, right? That enhances return. Let's keep costs low. Interconnectedness is also sometimes risky. Uh, when we think about the cyber threats that we're all facing now, and just to pick up Clemens mentioned, I say it all the time now. I used to be very careful about how I said this, but to heck with it. We get attacked, Southern Company, gets attacked about three million times a day. And that's very typical. Um, the barbarians are at the gate. And, and I can tell you, it is the big four. He mentioned the criminal, Puch mentioned the criminal enterprise. I always like to use movies as metaphors. James Bond, Spectre is real. And there are worldwide connected criminal enterprises that use statecraft, maybe procured on the dark web, to attack this system. And then when you think about the, the variability of climate change, so if you think about a distribution of outcomes with weather, the tails are now fatter. And so when you think about the cost of risk compared to the cost of the system, what we have to do as leaders 
is find a way, and this is where I've had so much fun with Jason over the years, find a way to get in the middle. We can't let the far left or the far right drive the conversation. I think it's the role of the business community to help understand where that constructive middle is and get there. Now, so, so you, one, so last point, right. one last all point right. and then I'll shut all up. Right. How do we get there? How do we make this happen? Well, uh, I can tell you uh, this conversation uh, about um, telecom. So when I started leading the uh, ESCC, I just became imbued with the spirit that we could not live in the silo, that this is a giant interconnected problem. That's why I've always loved the work of the Bipartisan Policy Center. You guys are very understanding of the connectivity of all these different constituent groups and how do we get them together. Well, I kind of learned from you a little bit and started doing something we called uh, Dinners Across America. And all I was trying to do was find people that had this idea that we've got to pull the oars together, whether it's the private sector or with government. That turned into the tri-sector group. And the tri-sector group became people that were believers from finance, telecom, and electricity. And so I would argue that the telecom guys have been involved, at least at the tri-sector level, germinating an idea for some time. As I was appointed to the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, the tri-sector group became effectively my Greek chorus. So as I was the only kind of private sector CEO on that commission, um, I needed somebody to kind of react and listen and advise, and they were terrific. 75% now of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission is in law. And so now what we're doing is taking what was an idea to a policy position now to operationalization. And so we're using those folks to help drive this. The last point on collaboration is the idea that if you go back to uh, the original uh, Solarium Commission put forth by President Eisenhower, it was this idea that post-World War II, we had to reimagine national security. We had the Soviet Union over here. We had the emergence of NATO over here. And the imagination of conflict was effectively a tank battle on the plains of Poland. And so what we had to do was think, OK, well, how are we going to be different? Today, in the cyber realm, the digital world, there is no ocean on our right and our left that protects us. There are friendly neighbors north and south, but the battles are not being fought overseas. And we cannot rely on the federal government to protect our telecom networks, our electricity grids, and our financial systems. And so we've got to join. Private sector has an obligation to collaborate, not cooperate, and join the fight. So you have mentioned one or two things I'd like to follow up on. Um, innovation, an area that we've talked about a lot in the past. So the country has to take some big risks. The taxpayers have just provided about $400 billion to the yeah. energy sector to provide some incentives and cushion. I want to talk to you about the culture of innovation. And let me just give you the frame, which is, if you're a venture capitalist and you are right one out of 10 times, you are a billionaire. That's right. If you are a DOE official and you are right nine out of 10 times, you're indicted. <laughs> How do we actually create a culture of innovation that gives us the plausible possibility of the acceleration that we need in energy technology and decarbonization? Jason, I think you're so right. What was, it was Solyndra. Right? Yeah. That was the cyber thing, I mean, the, the solar thing that didn't go well, and the DOE loan program got just eviscerated. And, and, for and they're a while. still hiding in their chairs, shivering a little bit. The greatest success of the, of the DOE loan program, what was it? Audience participation? It was the Vogel asset. And we're this close to erping uh, electricity out of a nuclear fission. Right, but, but Tom, that, that has not been an easy ride. You have been Tell able me to. Tell about it. Well, so, but you've been able to ride that out. You were not a government official. No, and that's right. But I think here's, here is where I was getting to at that point. We've got to get past that. And, and here's where I think the collaboration of private sector with government um, can be pretty powerful. And that is we have to join with government to give them the courage to fail. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I get into this idea about where we need to go, I've, I've been using the rhetoric of we got to get in the boat together. 
when I think about all the money at DOE right now that's been passed through these pieces of legislation, look, I can get, I can get to net zero, I can get 80% of the way there pretty clearly. I get it. I know how to do it, and we've got the building blocks in place. Boom. It's that last 20% where we're going to need real creative action on the part of the private sector and government. The government has a boatload of money right now. Yes. One of the things that we do now, and it's kind of a shame, value is a function of risk and return. Most of my industry brothers and sisters have withdrawn from proprietary research and development. Southern Company is the only one that remains robust proprietary R&D. We've had a big nuclear program. I'm on the American Energy Innovation Council, yes, sponsored are. by the Bipartisan Policy You're Center. You're so good at this stuff. Yeah. With, uh, <laughs> with Bill Gates, and partly as a function of that relationship, we and the Gates people have formed an enterprise to advance the so-called Gen 4 nuclear reactors, which have kind of the characteristic of being unable to melt down. Um, and we think that is a technology in the 30s. The last ask of Southern in that regard was to come up with around $200 million to advance R&D, that's a chunk of change. But the government, with DOE and the folks that we have in place now, with the wherewithal they have now, can be terrific partners in helping move the ball to where we need to get to attack that last 20%. So I think that's really important. I anticipate some reasonably aggressive oversight of the DOE and DOT. And I just want everyone to know that Tom Fanning has volunteered to be on that panel <laughs> talking about the importance of that collaboration and, and taking real risk. And I, I, I'm not joking. I, mean, I think that's going to be essential. I want to stay on this question of you know, speed and scale. As you point out, OK, you're 80% there. But that's not a self-actualizing truth, right? The speed with which we have to increase our infrastructure investment is unlike anything we've ever done before. You have made the commitment, as is almost every company with a website, to net zero by 2050. I have said publicly that based on our current democratic processes, I think we're going to get there by about 2087. <laughs> what are those barriers? And what does the government and the private sector, just a couple of them, I know there's dozens of them. What do you see as the key barriers to enabling industry to get there by 2050? And, and you want to know some, I, I think some of the barriers are kind of the marketplace in America, but I think we're moving there. So remember the old Thomas Friedman book, uh, The World is Flat? The world is not flat. And what we're going to have to do is realize, especially with these latest developments, Russia, Ukraine, China, the alliance it looks like with Iran, and where is Saudi Arabia these days with energy policy around the globe? Uh, we really do need to rethink kind of supply chains, not only of important critical infrastructure, but also people and skills and background and context. And, and, and so that goes to how we're going to grow jobs in America and how we're having an immigration policy. It, it covers so many things. We did an analysis, and I know you know this, and we, to get to 2035, where are the skilled workers going to come from? Sean McGarvey is a terrific leader of U.S. building trades. Where are those people coming from? How are we going to get that done? Tell me where the manufacturing supply chain is going to come from in order to get there. See, but this is, this is a nonpartisan issue. Growing America's economy, growing good paying jobs, resourcing in a friendly way the critical infrastructure supply chain, human capital, and equipment, manufacturing capability, is something that will benefit this nation, and we must get about right away. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about transmission, which is the essential both weak link and the enabler. Not unlike the two of us, most of the transition is in the second half of its useful life. There is a tremendous need to invest just in this moment. High winds knock out you know, hundreds of thousands of people's electricity. Yet our transmission system is fundamentally incapable of achieving climate goals. Right? There's lots of analysis out there, but a lot of folks cite the Princeton study, which says if, unless we double the rate of transmission build, we're going to lose 80% of the potential climate benefits in the IRA. In starker terms, at the current rate, emissions in the power sector are going to increase because we're going to need more coal and gas in order to meet demand. This permit reform conversation is something you have all thought about. So help me out here. Oh, like, what do we yes. need to do? 
Yeah, wait a minute. So uh, we're going to need all the arrows in the quiver here, sports fans. And if anybody thinks, I remember I was on the stage with the president of Ireland here recently, prime minister, whatever she was, and she was trying to outlaw hydrocarbons. You know, this is a stupid thing. We can't do that. Uh, what we need, the enemy is not the fuel, it is the carbon. And so what we need are technology developments that can manage the effluent, capture it, and do something with it. It isn't the input, it's the output. All right, so we're going to need all the renewables we can stand. Southern company, I'll just be parochial for a minute. Southern company's uh, approach to this is about 50% solar, a smidgen of wind. We just don't have much wind in the southeast. Uh, about 20% nuclear, about 20% natural gas with carbon capture. And, uh, and maybe blended hydrogen and some other stuff we're doing there. We did the uh, world's biggest test of blended hydrogen uh, here just right in Atlanta, maybe six months ago. And then 10% uh, then of other. Other may be energy efficiency. It may be direct carbon capture. Ernie Moniz is on our board, former energy secretary, terrific guy. And, and I remember when uh, AOC came out with, what was it, the Green New Deal? Heard of it. Uh, he came out with, very quickly, the Green Real Deal. And that, it was an article, I guess he wrote, co-authored with somebody else, mm -hmm. is our stuff. It's what we believe. Um, so here's the, here's the other interesting question in the, I mean, the other interesting point of the question you raised. 2050, I kind of get it, 2035. There is value in time because there you, you're able to let innovation and other things work for you to reduce the cost of the curve. The faster you move, the less you have the ability to let innovation, R&D advancements, all kinds of stuff work for you. There's a very interesting tug of war in that. And what I've always said is, yeah, we can get to 2050. I can see my way through, and, and I think we'll get there way before. 2087. But if you want to go to 2035, we're going to need everybody in the boat, and we're going to need to do some really interesting things to get there, but primarily get people, get the resource. Look, this is an imperative that the world has to address. And here again, I think the private sector can be leaders to, to, to create this constructive middle. We can show people the way. One, one last short story, but it's it's so important and impactful to me anyway. I hope it is to you. Every two years, the electricity sector goes through a giant war game called Grid X. And we, we, we take a situation, and the first stage is you have a cyber attack, and lights go out, and OK, we fix it, and we're back. And the second stage gets worse, third stage, fourth stage. And at some point, there's this thing called the FAST Act, where the president can invest in the federal government, the authority through DOE, to take over the electricity grid. And a fabulous guy that was on the NSC back then was Tom Bossert. Mm -hmm. Loved the guy, so smart. And at this point where the war game became critical, he says, I invoked the FAST Act. And, and I just kind of sit back, you know, in my normal passive way. And I say, <laughs> Tom, I got it. What are you going to do? Who are you going to call? 87% to be a nerd of the critical infrastructure in America is owned by the private sector. The government can't do for you at that point. They don't know how. We know how. What we have to do, hand in glove, work with the government to take us through these situations. And that's going to be the way through. We're not going to get a federally dictated policy to get to 2050 because they don't know how. So I have a last question for you. Um, and I apologize for not sharing time with the audience. So Machiavelli has said, you know, make no small plans, for they do not stir the soul. <laughs> you have been stirring a bunch of souls for four decades. And I want, and this is dangerous with our time frame, but tell me one of the things that you've been really proudest about. And then what's the unfinished business? What's the one thing that you want to see happen that you probably are not going to be able to get done on your own watch? You know, um... You're talking about my career at Southern? 43 years. You can almost know the company's history, but sure, your career. Yeah. You know, I would say then it's, uh, it is this idea of collaboration with the government. Uh, 
I can tell you, uh, as I came out of Solarium and the tri-sector group and this, this idea that somehow private industry has to lead and we have to collaborate with the government, there have been decades, perhaps a century or more, of the Heisman between the private sector and the federal government. Stay away, laissez-faire. I don't want you and I don't need you. All you do is mess me up. We've had to reimagine national security. We've had to reimagine the advancement of climate policy and the economy. I spent six years at the Atlanta Fed, chaired it three years, chaired the advisory board of the big Fed for a year during the transition from Yellen to Powell. And I can tell you the private sector has to step in the middle. And frankly, politically, that's a little off center. I think we can start to bring people together, as the Bipartisan Policy Center has tried to do, to create that reasonable voice. Now, what's going to be left undone in my time? I'm still passionate about it. In my time, I don't know what that means exactly. Uh, next 10 or 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it'll happen next 10 or 20 years. You see, I, I really think we need a national energy policy. I know that we've made runs at and the DOE has this uh, quadrennial energy plan. In response, oh gosh, this might be 20 years ago now, but in response to one of the early climate legislative efforts, EPRI came out with something called PRISM, and then they followed that with PRISM 2.0. And it was a regional optimized energy plan that was able to take into account generation, transmission, the whole idea of make, move, and sell in a single response that was very well thought out. If we could implement something like that across America and still preserve the rights of the states to get things done on their time frame in their way, I think that's so important. I don't want to blow up the Federal Power Act in the process. Uh, but I think America needs that now more than ever. Um, and, and, and please understand me. When I say we need a national energy policy, this is not just about carbon. Carbon's important, but clean, safe, reliable, and affordable. Oh, and not reliable, it's resilient. Reliable is how your system works when things are normal. Resilient is how your system works when the stuff hits the fan. Uh, that's what we need to aim for. Tom, it's always fun. Always Thank great, you so buddy. Much, You're the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. And now we'll welcome back Steve Clemens in conversation with Congressman Jim Himes. He's a Democrat from Connecticut and a member of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. He's a prominent voice on all matters of information security. Welcome, Congressman. Terrific. Thank you, Katie. Um, Congressman Jim Himes, thank you so much for joining us again today. I know that you this was going to be a tight uh, appointment for you today because you were supposed to be in the committee. Um, interviewing Sam Bankman Freed. Um, I, I, I may be the only guy in America yeah. who didn't get a chance to talk to Sam yeah, Bankman yeah. Freed. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so he's indisposed. What would you have? What What would you have asked him? Really, we're going to go there? I don't know. It's a little bit. Of, it's right, kind of a little bit let's there. Let's do this for thirty seconds. Yeah. So, so here's you know you know we've got uh, John Ray who is uh, you know once again swooping in to bail out a, or to fix a really a, a catastrophe, and and. Here's, you know, uh, Sam Bankman Fried said, my, my testimony is going to be unsatisfying, right? Now, this is a Hollywood blockbuster, right? I mean, this makes the others, this makes all the other frauds look crazy. This is a, you know, charismatic, odd, super smart 150 IQ gazillionaire, you know, that somehow persuaded the smartest money, the supposedly smartest money in this country, the Sequoias, the light speeds, to give him a ton of money. Uh, and then it all goes horribly wrong around a business that honestly very few people understand. Here's the thing, though. Um, Oh, we're looking for all the exotic stuff. Um, the, you know, wire fraud. You know, this this is stuff that has been happening. Bad stuff that's been happening. Commingling of funds, right? This goes back, you know, generations, right? Everything we're seeing happening with FTX, with the exception, arguably, of this token, this FTT token, mm -hmm. right? Everything else we've seen here is, you know, fraud that's been perpetrated for, you know, a hundred plus years. So, I, th I think there's a little less than meets the eye from a regulatory and legal standpoint. But you know. It's a Hollywood blockbuster. Thank you for sharing that. Now, let's get to the real stuff. <laughs> you said in June uh, 2021, every day we wake up to news of another business falling victim to a cyber attack. These attacks will only get worse 
unless we make serious changes. And that includes making cybersecurity a focus at the board level. I'm pleased the House passed your legislation to ensure investors have the knowledge they need about public companies' cybersecurity posture to make informed decisions. We've now had, with the passage of some legislation, we just talked to uh, a representative from it works at the uh, Department of Energy about infrastructure spending, about Inflation Reduction Act. I just like to know, from this point in June 2021, how much have we achieved? How vulnerable do we remain on the cyber front? Yeah, great, great question. So um, I think we've made a lot of progress. Um, you know, I came to the Congress in 2009 uh, when the word cyber would elicit the same confusion that a crypto asset token elicits today in the, in the you know, certainly the Financial Services Committee and the Congress generally. People really get it. Um, and, you know, the private sector has been largely out in front, right, investing billions of dollars, putting board level or close to board level people responsible for cyber. That's, you know, primarily been the financial services industry, other other really critical industries like power. Um, so I think we've made we've made good progress in understanding. We've made good progress around uh, the investments that the private sector has made. I think the federal government has configured itself with very, very good people, particularly in the executive who know what they're doing, who are very careful, who are watching the attacks that come into Ukraine right now, what's succeeding, what's not, what happens if that comes our way. One area where we have not made uh, nearly as much progress as we should, and I, I'll build on something that Tom said, um, uh, the communication between the government and the private sector is still not close to what it needs to be. Mm. Sadly, of course, the designation of uh, critically important uh, uh, systemic infrastructure was taken out of the NDAA. I'm not saying it was perfect, but we got to get there. We got to get there. And this is a flawed analogy. I'll admit up front it's a flawed analogy, but we need to move from the world that Tom was describing where I guess the power sector mainly, you know, never the twain shall meet with the government in the direction, here's the flawed analogy, of FAA and aviation, right, where literally it is a partnership, where there is self-disclosure, where there's constant real-time communication. Why do we do that in FAA? Because when an aircraft goes down, hundreds of people die. Guess what else can make hundreds of people die, right? A power network going down and hospitals being without power. So we are far from where we need to be in terms of that communication partnership even between the private sector and the government. Who would have, who are the villains in the story of removing that language from the NDAA? Well, um, I- Why I, would they remove that from National Defense Authorization Act if it's such a vital part of domestic national security? Yeah, I'm not, I, I, so I won't accept villains, right? Okay. Um, the, the interests are very real here. Um, I think some of them are more serious than others. What's more serious? Um, uh, the truth is that even the best regulators uh, aren't as current, smart, uh, aware of the risks as the people who actually run the infrastructure. So the uh, designations and all of the uh, requirements that come with those designations need to be two things, smart uh, and agile, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are networks that are, that are changing every single day. Right. Uh, you know, the federal government is not always known for being smart and agile. So there's no villains to this. Um, there are, I, I think that's a really smart concern. More broadly speaking, you know, we're out there saying you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, you know, particularly in the spyware realm, you know, we should have an international agreement not to do X, Y, Z. Well, when you say there's an international agreement not to do X, Y, Z, if I put my other hat on, intelligence, um, there may be people at Fort Meade who might be interested in doing X, Y, Z under certain circumstances. Right. Those are very real concerns. It just needs to happen faster. Uh, we, we have a <laughs> questioner um, who posed a question before, Paul Kunan from Empower Our Future. He asks, is there enough urgency in this topic? And I want to uh, piggyback on it and say, is there enough literacy in Congress? You know, you talked about how this discussion of cyber, you know, 10 years ago would have sounded like, you know, FTX and yeah. Bitcoin and whatever. Uh, I, I think I, I remain, um, you know, uh, hopeful that there is a literacy level amongst your colleagues to make smart um, decisions on this front. But where, where do you think we really are? Yeah, I, so the answer, uh, you know, urgency and literacy, no and no. Um, there's certainly not the urgency that we need. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story to illustrate that, and then let's get to, let's get to smart uh, or literacy. Um, colonial pipelines, right? We did not learn enough uh, from colonial pipelines. Okay, it was really uncomfortable that gas prices went up for a period of four weeks in a certain region of this country. That was uncomfortable, but it was not nearly as uncomfortable as what the doomsday scenarios could do. And so, again, look, Congress... We're a representative body, right? You know, we don't have, on average, 150 IQs. We are representatives of the people, right? So I'd like to believe we have 100 IQs on average, but that's, that's to be debated. 
my point is we're not experts, right? And we get elected by people to serve their interests. And um, so we respond to painful stimuli, you know, like paramecia and stuff. Um, we, we, and colonial pipelines wasn't enough. Here's my story. Uh, and, you know, I'm pretty intimately involved in this stuff through intelligence. In real time, colonial pipelines, honestly, the federal government didn't really know what was going on. You know, it was the communications with respect to malware were very, very slow. I asked a question towards the, uh, I asked an awkward question. So we're in, in a here. very reactive posture. On we're this. in a reactive posture. We don't have the real time, and I really do mean real time. I mean somebody, wherever it is, DHS, FBI, Fort Meade, wherever it is, having real time access to the people who are being attacked. You know, the same way we would do it if it was a kinetic attack. And we are not close to that yet. We got to get there. It's hard, right? Many of you will remember 2015, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act, right. right? That was brutally painful to get done for good reasons, right? You know, the private sector doesn't want to get sued for handing over personally identifiable information to DHS. So there's good reasons. But no, we don't begin to have the urgency we need. Literacy is a more mixed bag. Um, we have terrific experts. Solarium, I think Tom was part of Solarium. Right. Solarium was superb. We've got some experts. By the way, we're losing a lot of experts. You know, Jim Langevin, that's about half of our brain, you know, oh, <laughs> retiring wow. out of the House of Representatives. So, but literacy, we could, we, you know, and sadly, it's going to take, it's going to take another colonial pipelines or worse to combine the, to create the urgency, which will solve the literacy problem. You know, I've been spending a lot of time sort of digging into some of what Russia has been doing in terms of its cyber offense and what happened in Ukraine and have met, you know, folks from CrowdStrike and Microsoft and others and sort of look at some of the good story that came out of that because people made smart decisions uh, just before that, that attack. But I, I think it also raises an interesting question of what our own human resources in these areas are. And I know this may sound a little outlandish, but I've wondered whether or not we're at a cultural disadvantage on this front with our human resource talent in the cyber sector, both with defense and potentially offense, when you compare it to some of the nations that are hotbeds of either state-based or just illicit criminal activity, that there's a different culture, skill set, yes, but culture that is more permissive of a kind of criminality transnationally than we have. So are we able to marshal the people we need in the national security space, in the intelligence space, in the corporate space, or are we and and with the same kind of skill set and capabilities, or are we lagging in that area? Is that on your radar screen at all? I, th I think we're pretty good. You know, when I go visit Synchrony in uh, in uh, Connecticut, uh, um, you know, which is a G spin out, you know, I, I when I meet their cyber people, these are guys who you know used to be at NSA, used to be at the Secret Service. There's right. a nice interplay post retirement, right? Post retirement, there's a nice interplay between the private and the public sector. Pre-retirement is where we need to really focus more. And of course, we've got the typical challenge that you right. have in this space and lots of other spaces, which is that you know a guy with a lot of service doing remarkable things inside the government is worth 4x what he's worth inside, or mm -hmm. he or she, I should say, is worth. So that's a constant struggle. One we can, one we can address. I mean, I really do worry about, um, you know, when I think about offensive cyber, you know, the really, we don't talk a lot about these guys, but the, 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 the remarkable hackers, right? I mean, their market value inside the federal government is a tenth of what it is out in Palo Alto or whatever. So that's a, a, an ongoing problem. But no, I think we do pretty well. I mean, does Estonia have better programmers and cyber smarts per capita than we do? Maybe, but I'm not sure that many Well, their system do. was taken down and their whole, their whole nation frozen uh, in, in exactly. effect. Let me ask you another question um, that I've been thinking about, which is the... Um, climate dimension of spending today. So climate and and dealing with you know carbon emissions and and, and putting in systems that are that are um, better in conservation and building in smart data as we were discussing a minute ago to kind of get communications uh, into the infrastructure looking at new grid. Climate is a big driver of the political rationale used to explain new spending. But that's really a different question than security and cyber. Are we making, does the spending and does the infrastructure investment become politically vulnerable when you move in a couple of weeks from being in the majority to the minority? I could be talking to Sam Bankman Fried right now. You remind. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so I, I actually think it's linked, right? Um, yeah. So, you know. I know you think it's linked, but do the people coming in after you think it's linked? Oh, um, uh, so there's a lot less commitment. Um, on the part of the new majority to leaning in to the, you know, the, 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 all the many ways we'll address climate change. That's just a, that's just a fact. Um, and that hurts me because we're already moving too slowly with respect to 
decarbonizing the economy. So yeah, um, now the good news is obviously as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, whatever you think of the title of that act, it actually was a staggering investment in climate change and that will play right. out over time. Um, but, but the two are really very linked and maybe there's, a, maybe there's a sort of partisan hook here, which is I think most people would agree that um, you, know, you don't even need to sign up for a carbon tax or a cap and trade system to say, wow, mm. where you've got you know, whatever it is, 25% of the, of the generation capacity of the nation in a nuclear fleet, which you can't turn off, you've got an interesting dynamic where, gosh, wouldn't it be better to run your dryer or charge your Tesla or whatever car you have you know, at 2 in the morning? Um, to do that, of course, you can do that, and you save a lot of money, and everything becomes much more efficient and stable. But to do that, you need a lot of comms on the network. And that's good, but of course that creates even more vulnerability because if you've got all those comms on the network and they can take the comms down, now you've got a huge problem. Where are you on, you know, we just heard Tom Fanning talk a little bit about G4 and nuclear. Um, where are you on the nuclear front? You know, it's a, another interest of mine right now that while we were very critical of Nord Stream um, in Europe and the energy dependencies that were in place, and there's been a lot of movement to shift those. The United States today, about 20% of our nuclear fuel needs are produced here, and I'll tell you, I'm all writing. I'm writing an article that all of you can tune into, and uh, uh, if you'd like to later on, on um, I'll quote I'll share from Ernie Moniz, a former Secretary of Energy, who basically says the United States is in violation today of its own nuclear nonproliferation treaty because it is not generating the nuclear fuel that it is that is uh, should be providing to its allies. Uh, like Korea, like Taiwan, others that are out there, that that's an obligation in that treaty, which is interesting. I'm looking at Phil Sharp, because maybe he can give me a quote where Ernie's wrong. They're like great friends. But, um, you know, we like disagreement in the publication I met. But, I mean, I, I would like to know a little bit on the connection between the nuclear side of this security as we kind of look at the future, the climate dimensions of nuclear, which are so important, but, but also our own dependency on Russia. Yeah, so, I mean, here's where is I lose. That, is, it, is it known in Congress that we have a dependency on Russia? Um, well, yeah. I mean, okay. the, the dependency on Russia, obviously, the focus is on Germany. Right. You know, it's a little more tenuous to the yeah. United States. But, um, you know, all right, here's the controversy where I lose a bunch of friends. Every time I say this, I lose a bunch of friends. The irrational, emotionally driven fear of nuclear power is a catastrophe for this country and even more so for Germany. Right? Germany decides they're going to shut down their nuclear fleet. You know, bad idea from a carbon standpoint turns out to be a really bad idea from an, an energy security standpoint. Um, and I won't, I won't go on about this. I think we all know the story. You know, I mean, just hold the danger and the risk and the deaths and the fatalities and the black lung or whatever you want to do of coal mining next to the handful of people who have passed away, unfortunately, as a result of nuclear power. And you're just, this is why I say it's visceral and emotional. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we got to get that right, and we're not. Now, my own state of Connecticut, about half of our generation comes from the Millstone nuclear generator. The other half is natural gas. Millstone's cranking away. You know, thank goodness there's never been a serious effort to shut it down, but it's cranking away. The other 50%, the natural gas, because we're at the end of the pipelines coming out of the Marcellus regions of Pennsylvania, electricity prices for my constituents are going to close to double in the coming months, right? And so... You know, I love the Sierra Club. I love those guys. Come, I'm going to work with you. But when you're in my office blowing up over nuclear, let me introduce you to my 750,000 constituents and what they think about the doubling of the per kilowatt hour charge that they're already paying. Where are you on permitting reform? Let's do it. Um, you know, uh, Ezra Klein, you know, noted left-wing intellectual, I guess, says, how, how has the party that is dedicated to the idea that you, the government can build big things, in some ways that's a left of center view, we believe that government can build big things. How is it possible that we've so tied ourselves up in red tape that we can no longer build anything? We can't build 10 units of affordable housing because we have so tied ourselves up. Now, that's not a call for hurting the environment or you know regulation. This is also a democratic thing. It exists for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not calling for a dumb you know, elimination of regulation, but let's figure out a way in a world of data science, in a world of instant communications, to have a regulatory system that is 21st century rather than 19th century. I think we could do that. Now, you've been, uh very, you've been a leader in the security, you know, kind of looking at the security side, the financial side, Securities Exchange Commission, um, basically transparency and cybersecurity risk and letting, I mean, that's part of the thing that, that, that you sponsored. 
And it's really interesting because when um, North Korea, you know, state-based attacks on Sony happened, and I interviewed then the Homeland Security Advisor, the President, there was a lot of criticism then of the private sector and saying the private sector was not stepping up to the plate and doing what it needed to put prophylactics to protect it in, in that dimension. I guess my question to you is, how does a company know? What are the dimensions of knowledge when it comes to risk cyber protection and the kind of transparency that you're saying, hey, investors have a right to know what sort of vulnerabilities are. I'd just love to kind of get the nuts and bolts, not only for the folks in the room, but the folks watching, because I think it's a fascinating area, because you, you, you need to kind of have a, 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 a revelation, if you will, of the standards of protection that a company has, right? Yeah, yeah, so, okay, um, you, you know, what does a company know? Um, you know, uh, this is an area where more interaction with the government would make sense. The government, the federal government, variety of different three-letter agencies, see malware right. uh, that could easily get out into the, you know, could easily infect the private sector. Again, that should be a real-time right. conversation, and it's not. You asked about the SEC in particular. I mean, the SEC has a very narrow role around capital market stability and investor protection. Mm -hmm. So in as much as a risk is material to investors, you know, yeah. So when I say yeah, yeah, you know, the SEC should ask businesses to disclose. Um, what would really help there, and again, I'm sorry about what happened in the NDAA, what would really help there would be a acknowledged set of parameters and standards where a company could say, we've met these parameters and standards. That's not enough, right, because those parameters and standards need to evolve and adapt, but that would at least be a good, uh, a good place to start. And, and maybe it could even serve as a form of some liability safe harbor. This was what we did in 2015, right? We'll agree, you know, we'll, we'll agree to protect you from some liability for your act of giving the federal government information, malware, whatever it might be. You know, just finally, I want to go to the audience. The Bipartisan Policy Center is bipartisan. They bring in members. We'll have Kathy McMorris Rogers in here uh, shortly and, and always sort of talking to, to both sides. Is this topic terrain one that's easy to work across the aisle on, or are there dimensions that are um, really, really big chasms politically between, between both sides of the aisle? Yeah, um, so yes, I think it is an area generally that is pretty easy to get done. I think the Solarium, Solarium Commission really demonstrated that, and the really remarkable relationships that exist with, you know, amongst those folks, Mike Gallagher on the Republican side, right. and, you know, I talked about Langevin and, and, and others. So generally speaking, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a really fruitful area for, for bipartisan cooperation. You know, the ideologies do impinge. You know, I'm constantly hearing the refrain that I hear from my right a lot, which is, well, one size fits all, regulation doesn't work. And I'm like, really? A 500 kilovolt uh, transmission line in Ohio is radically different than one in Connecticut. Explain that to me. Um, but anyway, I'm, I just Ill, I just say that you know you do hear the ideology, but I don't think it. I, I said this before. The concerns that are slowing us down are are not villainous. They're they're real concerns that we just need to deal with more rapidly. Interesting. Thank you for that. Let me open the floor to questions and comments from from the folks. Go ahead, Susan. She winked at me. No, that one's, I mean, like I, you break the ice, just make it good. Okay, so you were talking about <laughs> Colonial and how you didn't know much, and I just wanted to point out that at least with pipelines, they're federally regulated. Do you have thoughts about this idea? I mean, as an Exelon, you know, a utility company, we have cyber programs that extend from transmission into distribution. There isn't like a clear line. And a lot of that is not under federal jurisdiction at all. So, you know, what are your thoughts about interaction? Are you hoping that it does state? get under federal I'm not going to go and yet. say that we're looking for a national standard. I don't think we're yeah. at that point there. But I know there's a lot of chatter around yeah. having national standards on cyber that extend down to distribution. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Great question. I don't have smart thoughts about that. Um, <laughs> but let me tell you what I believe. Um, <laughs> you know what I do for a living. Um, so, so there are models for for state regulation, right? So, in my in my financial services world, right, we we regulate retirement accounts at the federal level, ERISA, SEC, all that good stuff. But you know, uh, property and casualty uh, insurance is at the state level. Mm. Kind of works. Um, so, I do get intrigued, and here's where I show that I don't really know a lot about the nuts and bolts of this. But I do really get intrigued on the distribution side, right? There are some geographically. The, the, the criticism I made fun of earlier that one size doesn't fit all, guess what? Distribution in Florida is subject to different stresses than distribution in northern Minnesota, right? So, so it feels to me, again, like the answer is a hybrid um, cooperation 
what I really want and what I really know I want and, um, is I want information flow, uh, particularly of real-time evaluation and uh, uh, exposure, I guess, of both malware, um, which can come in to anybody, maybe Fort Meade, it may be a consumer in Texas, and also best practices. And at the end of the day, it's the federal government that is in the best position to disseminate those two things. Thank you. Other questions? We've got time yet. Bill? No? Oh, how about right here? Very good. I said yes. Um, I'm we're going to bring you the mic because we're live online, so we want to make sure folks can, can hear online. So, And tell us who you are. Uh, I'm Lori Pickford. I'm with the Bipartisan Policy Center. And I understand that the utility industry is having problems getting transformers. And it's a supply chain issue, and it's also a workforce issue. And they've come to Congress asking if they can use, you know, DPA right. authority. Just wondering if you have any thoughts on that and if they'll get any assistance as we go into weather-related events for the winter. So I got the signal a minute ago that they that. to an extend angry red it. Folder. I was extending it and then hard wrapping it. So I've had both signals. So I think we're hard wrapping it. So go ahead after you, after this. Um, yeah. Uh, interesting question. Not one that I've thought about. Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, uh, I'm also very conscious of the fact that we've had some attacks on our on our transformer. So it feels to me like number one, let's get to the bottom of that. Who understands how vulnerable these things are and start shooting at them? Uh, and 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 number two, um, I don't know if we could DPA solve this in the very near term. If this is a this winter thing, it ain't, it ain't happening through the DPA, right? But if the expansion of the uh, of the grid in all the ways it needs to expand and evolve to service, you know, all the the, the Internet of Things and everything having its own battery requires that, I hope that we could be, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't hope. I hope that the private sector, through trip, typical demand and supply signals, addresses this. But um, this is essential. So if we need to wade in, I don't know if it's through the DPA, but, but um, we'll, 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 I hope, be partners. Well, Congressman Jim Hines of Connecticut, thank you so much for the straight talk, the candor. Always good to see you, sir. Thank you very thank much. You very Appreciate much. it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Oh, I stay seated. You guys having fun? Yeah, okay, we're having fun. Hey, Kami, how are you? We're your added bonus as we uh, wait for our last guest to arrive. I'm going to welcome Jason Grumet back to stage. Um, oh. And Jason and St Jason's got a lot of thoughts on uh, implementation of the infrastructure bill um, and the IRA. Oh, good. Tell us your thoughts on the IRA and the infrastructure bill. And congratulations. Can we tell them what you're going to be doing? Sure. Yeah? I mean, is that bad form? No, I don't know. I mean, okay. everything's awkward. I mean, we're all, we're all living hybrid lives. Um, Jason is the uh, National Clean Power Association? The American Clean Power American Association. Clean Power. So, so very relevant to today's topic, uh, Jason, who has been so important in building this vital center in Washington, is, has now been announced as the next president of the American Clean Power Association. Um, so it's very relevant to the question of infrastructure, energy, security. So when you move from this place to over there, um, what's the first thing you're going to do? So, I mean, look, it's the same job. It's just a slightly different venue. Um, country's at an incredible inflection point. Right? This is the last decade where we get to say this is the last decade we can do something about climate change. $400 billion check has just been written that the country is not able to cash. And that's because of everything you heard earlier today, just about the, you know, democracy's ability to move fast. Now, there's a B.B. King song, I'm built for comfort, but I ain't built for speed. That's a pretty good description of our you know, federal government. So I think there's a tremendous amount of work that just has to be done in order to enable the Can transition. Can I ask you a question? I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you a genuine question because I don't know anything. Are we smart enough to know how to invest those dollars in ways that are going to create recurring good returns for the economy? without recurring effort. I mean, because there's always the question when you get an industrial policy of, I hate to say the words corruption, but let's say mismanagement of resources, poor deployment of resources. I mean, are we good enough to get beyond the kind of politicization of the flow of that money into the efficient, smart, beneficial use of it? A lot, I, I yeah, yeah. also lose a lot of friends when I ask this question, because, but I, I worry that we're, we're sometimes not good enough, so actually. We are good enough to succeed if we want to. And just to put this in a little historical context, you know, 50 years ago, like an Apollo rocket literally burned three astronauts to death on the launch pad. Mm. And like we mourned, we stiffened our spine, and we put people on the moon because everybody wanted to succeed. I think something that hopefully we can talk with uh, 
the next uh, guest about is how do we get over the just historically terrible process that Congress just went through hmm. to advance the IRA, right? It, is, it was a, you know, the infrastructure bill was a strong bipartisan effort, but, you know, the IRA was a incredibly partisan by design. And, you know, the downside of that is it took a lot of issues that fundamentally have broad-based support and put a partisan sheen on them. And so I think there's a real question, and Tom talked about this, we are going to fail in heroically embarrassing ways if we have any chance of making the big moves necessary for 2050. Well, this, What's going to happen when well, those things happen? You know, as you know, I've interviewed Senator Manchin a lot about this. And one narrative on that is that the Bernie Sanders version of Build Back Better started out as $6 trillion, came down to three and a half, then it was 1.75. And then somewhere end up you you know end up with like a half a billion dollar bill. On one hand, in one narrative, you would expect wouldn't wouldn't the GOP be applauding that, and wouldn't it, it was the most be it was the most that? substantively yeah. bipartisan, politically partisan bill in American history. Yeah. Right? I mean, at the end of the day, it was an energy infrastructure bill. Right. Right. And with some significant efforts to address um, you know pharmaceutical costs for a number of you know, you know critically burdened Americans. But you know if you look back to what Senator Manchin and Murkowski did in 2020. They right. passed a broad-based energy bill. It was bringing 30 bipartisan bills together. It was the most beautiful process. It lacked for one thing. There was no cash, hmm. right? It was a tremendously significant authorizing bill. Right. What Senator Manchin basically quietly did was come up with the appropriation hmm. to fund that bipartisan bill. But the world doesn't see it that way. And when there are errors in judgment or execution, there is going to be um, a tremendous amount of you know, public outrage. Part of the Manchin approach, and I'm going to just be truthful with folks here, was that he saw the permitting element and the appropriations as a single package yeah. that America needed both. But for legislative reasons, you had to process them differently. Yeah. They were a single deal. And and to their credit, Senator Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, um, you know, the, the, the Democrats, you know, all, and, and President Biden agreed with that. Their rank and file didn't, which they're not forced to, but with all of the um, salutations and celebration of the amount of money that went into clean energy, it looks like the progressive wing of the Democrats didn't remember or understand that it was a package deal. And they're the ones that have, have um, said they're not supportive of that permitting bill. And, and, and so I'm interested in this. Is there enough realism in this discussion in the Democratic caucus to make progress? Uh, not yet. Um, but deadlines have an interesting way of kind of focusing the consciousness. Mm. And when people start to do the math, there will be a clear appreciation that we have technology, we have resources that we actually cannot implement. And, you know, that's not just true for, you know, pipelines. It's true for solar and wind and battery storage and sequestration and geothermal and hydro and everything. And I think the issue is that there's been a lot of trauma. Right? I think the response from a lot of the environmental you know, community, environmental justice community was, this bill will let more bad things than good things happen, which is just not true. Right, 80% of the energy that was built last year was renewable. Mm. Making the space broader for building is not going to change that. Now, are there going to be some pipelines? Mm. There sure better be, because we are not in a position to move to you know, anything close to 100% renewables in the next 10 years. So, we are going to have to have a transition that actually honors the history and economics of communities across the country. And I think the answer is, can we get there? Not unless people like you know, Senator Sanders and you know, AOC actually do the math and urge people to succeed. You know, I was taking with Susan. I'm oh, Susan, I'm going to pick on you for a minute. But Susan asked these questions that remind me a lot of that the, you know, like I was alive in 1996, folks, and I was watching the Telecom Act. It was very confusing. Went to tons of events, some of which I sponsored at the Economic Strategy Institute, where you'd walk away thinking we hit all the right buttons, but none of us knew anything more. It was one of the most convoluted, constantly churning arenas to look at how do you basically re-regulate or deregulate or look at the different arenas. And I just love the way, Susan, you framed the last question about you know, how do you begin thinking about this infrastructure and the duties or the, 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 the products that are generated from it in a smart way and also embed security. So I guess my question to you, I mean, at BPC, and I do read your reports, is, is are we running the risk of creating such a cloud over this process of looking at the, that the, the, the forthcoming uh, improvements of the energy infrastructure that we lose sight of what's important? Yes. 
So, you know, look, every revolution, if you look at it closely, was a series of evolutionary steps. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality about how democracy is going to work. But I think we do have to have a broader sense of courage. I mean, there are any number of people who once a day proclaim that climate change is the most important challenge of our day, mm -hmm. except for anything else they care about. Right. I think that, you know, you actually have to then acknowledge that some other things that you care about are, in fact, less important. We also have to be willing to recognize that our you know, legislative framework is 50 years old. Mm. The Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act. I mean, there was an incredible surge of, you know, public engagement in environmental things 50 years ago. And now we're trying to solve a completely different problem. And if we are so invested in those aging statutes, just like our aging infrastructure, we're not going to get all the way there. When you, when you move into your new role and you're focused on clean energy, as you kind of look at the other parts of the energy sector, how, how do you interact with them? I mean, how do, do, is it a moral question around no. your member? I mean, no, I, I, mean the, I have I mean, to like, ask like that. Like time answer. out, right? I, ha yeah. the, I have the to clean ask, energy, because there is an element. I mean, I, just yeah. ha I have to ask you, you have to do your yeah, job. Yeah. No, but look, know, but it's a, not, first of all, it's not yeah. my job. Yeah. But yeah. there is a small is beautiful imagination which has nothing to do with solving climate change in the real world. And you know, like the clean power industry, which I'm learning a lot about, um, is a big, giant industry that needs to be big wind and big solar and big build big things. Right. And you know, a major attribute of that industry is it actually can generate a lot of revenue and a lot of economic growth. Right. It is not an environmental movement that happens to make a lot of money. And that is just something that I think that transition has happened. It has to happen, I think, in a more you know, public way. Well, I share with you, when I was working for Jeff Bingaman in the 90s, we tried to look at what kinds of tax changes could we make to really help workers deal with the turbocharged economy and look, you know, tax. And, and we came up with something called A Corp taxes. That if you're like doing these, you know, things to, to, to help workers with portable benefits, et cetera, you do it. Um, and, and with all due respect to Bob Reich, he came out and kind of stole our idea, wrote an article, and called it the responsible corporation. Mm -hmm. And he infused it with these questions of morality. And that then immediately killed our idea. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I mean, I think it's part of the same question, which you come in and look at the energy infrastructure and investments. How do you get odd bedfellow supporters for the same goal, right? Which is to get cleaner, stable, better energy. We're going to discuss this with, with um, Kathy McMorris Rogers in a moment, but how do we be smart about it, but kind of detoxify the environment so that we can be smart on all ends of the energy environment? So, look, I, you know, I think almost every significant company in the country and world believes in some version of you know, stakeholder capitalism, right? It's more than just maximizing profits in every 90 days. Welcome, Congresswoman. I will just end. Um, she is so glad you're here. You saved them from the zinger question. I, was gonna, no. <laughs> I will just end with the recognition that the product has to be better. Right? If the clean energy revolution is not producing better products, right. cleaner, cheaper, more reliable, we are not going to get there in time. Right? The, people, the reason why people love electric cars, ignore their price tag, they're better. Yeah. They're better products. You're not sacrificing to drive a you know, Hyundai Ion. Um, and that's going to have to become the truth for, right. I think, all the clean energy transition. And with that, Big round of applause, Jason Gremmett, president delighted. of the Bipartisan Policy Center. Jason, thank you, sir. To welcome the next thank chair you. of the Energy yeah, and Commerce great. Committee. Great. <laughs> are, are we being, uh, yeah, let's do it appropriately. We, we're going to be appropriate. Hey, good to thank see you, you again. Jason. Great to see you. Yeah, thank you. Our final Jason. guest this morning is Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, a Republican from Washington State and the ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Welcome, Congresswoman. Very soon, that won't be ranking member. That's right. Right. And so, yeah, tell us what's me chair. yeah, Madam Chair. So, <laughs> Madam Chair Elect or Madam Chair to be. Um, tell me what you're going to do in the front end on the question of energy security. And I also want to say that you've been very active you know, talking about Texas, talking about various ways in which we need to improve uh, energy infrastructure smartly. There's now money to do it. How do we do it right? Well, that's, that's going to be our goal. Make sure that America is leading. America is blessed with abundant energy resources. And we've also led in the, the innovation and the technology that is going to lead the way, not only for meeting our energy needs here, and doing it in a reliable, affordable way, but also leading the way for the world. And so I'm, I'm just really excited about continuing to build upon 
um, the strong foundation. Uh, certainly, energy is important to everything that we do. It's our right. it's 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 our national security. It's our economy. It's our standard of living. And so, uh, uh, American leadership matters, and we just need to continue to lead the way. We need to unleash American energy, continue to lead in bringing down carbon emissions, and uh, unleash new innovation and technology. So you are a big proponent of grid resiliency. Are you surprised after your many years in Congress that we're, that America has to talk about its grid? Like, I mean, when you go to South Korea, it has an active grid. It's got, you know, everyone connected on the internet. I just find it sometimes humbling to think that we don't ha we have crumbling infrastructure. And so Texas got cold. You were very active talking mm -hmm. about, you know, Texas's uh, dependence, and they have a full spectrum energy side. Mm -hmm. What are we missing? What's the deficit in the investments that we're making when it comes to grid resilience from your perspective? Well, I think uh, resilient, a uh, resilient grid, making sure that we have reliability is, it's foundational, obviously, but we're putting more demands on the grid all the time. And so it's, it is making sure that we are investing in that energy infrastructure. I think sometimes we take for granted, you know, that our, our infrastructure is strong and it is safe. And, and, and yet you, you So look that at, sounds arrogant. Well, I think we just got to make sure that we're not that, not of you being arrogant, but of our, our our confidence being arrogant. Well, and I think it's important that we keep keep investing in the grid. That we just you know we we're, we're putting more demands on it, and so uh, when it comes to our our electric grid, uh, and there's the projections are pretty, uh, you know, it's going to be significant increases in demand on the grid, and so. Uh, I think it just uh, we got to be we got to be taking those steps now to make sure that we have so, the reliability. Madam Chairman, you know, one of the questions I have, I just I just posed it to Jim Himes, who was mm -hmm. here, is a lot of the shell casing of the spending and infrastructure and investment, the Inflation Reduction Act that the Biden administration has been doing has been around the climate dimensions as opposed to the security dimensions mm -hmm. or the security of supply or cybersecurity side of this. It, are you, when, when the Republicans take control of the House, does the shaping of investment need to move away from being focused? I mean, you just mentioned reducing carbon emissions, mm -hmm. but for, the, for your broader caucus, is it going to be more successful to move from the climate rationale to the security rationale? Well, we, we have to do both, right? I don't think it's an either or. And that's mm. where energy, as I was saying, is foundational to everything. It is our national security. And, and my goodness, well, with uh, Putin's aggression in Ukraine, people in Ukraine living without mm. heat or electricity right now. I mean, this is real. And the importance of us having security, uh, a secure grid is foundational to our national security. But it all, and there's more attacks as we're, uh, we're putting more right. devices and more demands on the grid. It just, it means that there's more opportunities for the bad guys to also attack the grid. And we're, and whether it's a physical attack or a cyber attack, there's, there's, you know, it, it, there's more vulnerabilities, and that's why it's important. But it's also, you think about our economy, our competitiveness, uh, making sure that we have reliable, affordable energy and that our grid is uh, able to meet all those demands. It's just, uh, it, it needs to be all. It so, needs to be both. So part of that picture is the nuclear picture, and it's very interesting to me that we don't make most of our own nuclear fuel needs for our nuclear reactors. We import that nuclear fuel from other providers. Some of them are allies. And guess what? Some of them are not. About 20% of our nuclear fuel needs comes from Russia. Do you think we need to reverse that and begin um, reinvesting in nuclear fuel making capacity in the United States? Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, I'm very excited. That's three yeses, four yeses. Yes, okay. <laughs> another one. You know, we, we, you know, America ingenuity has led the way in so many, uh, historically, advanced nuclear reactors, uh, next generation technology for nuclear uh, power is exciting in being able to meet our needs and uh, the advancements in recycling the fuel, the waste, so that we we are addressing one of the biggest concerns with nuclear. But yes, we are. Yeah, but we need highly enriched uranium, and right now uh, we are we get too much of that from Russia, and it is a damper on our ability to continue to lead in the small nuclear reactors, the advanced nuclear reactors, and. This is one example, but unfortunately, it's repeated. Uh, so, so yeah, we don't. We, we used to mine uranium in my district. Hmm. We don't do that anymore. Uh, you rich, enrich uranium. That is. Uh, is it? Is there still this, some there to be mined? Well, uh, they're focusing on the cleanup right now, but uh, uh, you know, I, the cleanup of the mine, uh, right, which is part of the process. But 
you know, I, I don't know if they're the invest. We used to do a lot of mining in my district. We used right. to find gold, silver, lead, magnesium. All those sure. mines have shut down in just the last couple of decades. And 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 when I talk to those that were doing the mining, it would just became cost prohibitive, you know, so they went to other countries around the world. Mm -hmm. Now America is realizing that we have shut down mining access to critical strategic minerals in the United States mm -hmm. and become dangerously dependent upon other countries. And so on uh, advanced nuclear, on yeah. uh, enriched uranium, yeah, we we need to, I believe we need right. to look at this question and uh, and, and look at what it's going to take to Tell, be able to do the mining and the process. I mean, when we've talked before, one of the things I really enjoy about our conversations is you have a really good feel. You go spend time with your constituents. I'm not to say that all of your members don't do that, but some do it more than others, and you talk to them. Do they have, you were just talking about the weaponization of energy by Russia and what's going on in the world. And, and what that has meant for Eastern Europe is I, I just returned from Slovakia and met foreign ministers very tense, right? So oh, yeah. the energy needs, the energy prices, you know, 10 times spike in provision of energy in some of these Eastern European states. And I'm just wondering whether Americans, one, feel the sense of crisis right now over Ukraine and Russia and what's happened with energy and it being fungible. And do they feel like the transition costs we're making right now in this moment are worth it? Or do they feel that those prices that we're having to pay to essentially have a proxy conflict with Russia and Ukraine are not worth it to them. Where, where, what's the psyche of your constituent right now on this? There's, there's overall concern about rising costs. Right. But they, they see it at the gas pump. Mm -hmm. They're, we're heading into winter. Spokane is having, we uh, we're, it's a winter wonderland. We're, right. we've had lots of snow. It's cold. We're not a, uh, expected to go above 32 degrees for next 10 days at least, you know, so it's cold and people see it mm. reflected in the, the, the cost prices. of heating their homes. It's, it's real and mm. especially for the lower lower income, it, it hits them the hardest. I, I think that what is happening in Europe is really a clarion call to the United States of America that we really need to pay attention. And, and to your point, the Eastern European Union or the Eastern Euro, Euro, EU com, uh, countries okay. as well as Ukraine I was there, it's been several years ago, but they were they were begging us for liquefied natural gas, send over some, you know, we we, we don't want to be dependent upon Putin, President Putin for a Nord Stream 2 pipeline or getting our supply from Russia. And as far as the people in Eastern Washington, I think there's, a, yeah, there's, there, more are paying attention. It, it has, it has brought it home the reality of how foundational energy is and that you can't take for granted you know it, kind of where we started we have to keep investing in energy infrastructure to make sure that we have reliable affordable right. and continue to bring down carbon emissions and lead the world have you been surprised that the um permitting bill that senator manchin drafted and that drafted by Senator Shelley Moore Capito. Now, there may be others out there, but those are the two I'm most familiar with. Haven't found a middle somewhere. Because when you look at it, the GOP has wanted permitting reform so deeply, so long, so yeah. persistently. Um, and I understand all the frustration with Joe Manchin and the IRA, but you know, fundamentally, it was out there. And then you had Nancy Pelosi, and you had Joe Biden, and Chuck Schumer, on board with a permitting thing, which is not a normal characteristic of their political slant. Yes. Are you missing, is the GOP missing a unique opportunity to have had the leading Democratic leaders on a major permitting reform bill? Well, the Democrats tried to do it alone. Uh, that, that doesn't usually work out very well for either party. Yeah. I, th I believe there, there is a, a growing recognition. There was a, there was a moment mm certainly when Senator Manchin was making this a, a key issue for the Inflation Reduction mm, Act. There's, right. a, there, there's a growing recognition that you just highlighted across the board, across the ideological spectrum, that we need to address permitting in the United States of America. And it's not, and we can up, continue to uphold our high environmental standards, highest right. Uh, yeah. Cleanest water, cleanest air, yeah. you know, most countries around the world, we've led the world. And what we need in permitting is certainty. Mm -hmm. There And there needs to be 
uh, we need to address how long it takes to do anything in the United States. And right. there's a growing recognition, whether you want to build a solar farm uh, or, you know, build a nuclear plant, it takes way too long. It takes years, decades in some cases, and all of that means more cost, and it makes it difficult, if not impossible, mm -hmm. to do anything. And when it comes to energy infrastructure and uh, investing in the energy infrastructure of the future, we, we must address permitting. I, I think it's the single biggest barrier to us uh, being able to really move forward right now to do anything. So do you think that regardless of whether it passes in these next couple of weeks in some forms, that it's going to remain a high priority in some way? Yes. And that the, I mean, I'll just be honest with you. I mean, I've, you've, you're, 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 an, you're, you're a deal maker. You, you talk to people across the aisle. You get things done. But the question is, a lot of folks out there that may be wrongly typecasting the incoming House look at the House as, um, you know, the GOP-controlled House is one that may not work across the aisle as, as much as may need. I'm not sure that that's true. The question is, on permitting, will it be an area where they try and change the dimensions and really make this a priority? Because I agree with you that I'm allowed to have opinions in my former journalists, that, that, I, that I, I find it one of the elements that's missing in the portfolio of America's energy competitiveness, right? So is it going to remain a high priority in, under your Absolutely. Tenure? It's been a long-time priority for the Republicans. We have, uh, for as long as I've been in Congress, I have been advocating for permitting reform. I come from Washington State. We are, we're 70 percent hydropower. There's right. hydropower in every state in the union. We could double hydropower mm -hmm. without building a new dam simply by you know, uh, only 3% of the dams produce electricity, so we convert them. And it's clean, renewable, reliable. But the permitting, it takes 10 years on average to relicense a dam. Mm. That's that's way too long. And that's, that's repeated over and over and over in every sector. So uh, we're, we, as the incoming chair of Energy and Commerce, yeah. I am <laughs> excited to go to work on this. You sound a, very and, excited. And, and, yeah. and, and, and to find the, the, the bipartisan uh, agreement. We all want to uphold those high environmental standards, uh, but I, I have, I, I chaired a task force to modernize NEPA several congresses right. ago. I know that we can do it without and uphold the high standards, but actually get get decisions, make get things done. And Garrett Graves on our side of the on uh, Republican lead, who's mm -hmm. been very active on this issue. Uh, he has the Builder Act. That's one that I would commend to people, and, and we will. The Energy right. and Commerce Committee is a committee at the forefront of, of energy security and, and, ener and uh, unleashing American energy, and, and we're going to look for finding the common ground. Uh, we're going to work on behalf of the people. Yeah. That's what and we're going to do. And real finally, real quickly, I'm going to open the floor just for a couple of minutes, is the, um, is the cyber side of this. I was talking mm -hmm. to Jim Himes, and he was just – honest, I think, and candid that the literacy among his colleagues is not where it needs to be mm -hmm. on the fragility in the system when it comes to cyber. Yes. You know, when you are chair of the committee, are there things to, you know, do some teach-ins, uh, yes. bring your, yeah. uh, uh, mem you know, members along and, and their staff member to kind of enhance the literacy level of the fragility that we have out there, the ransomware attacks, the malware. We had Tom Fanning from Southern Company here speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, this sort of constant siege that many of our leading energy companies are under mm -hmm. is something I think most of the public would be horrified if they knew. Right. Um, and many of them are watching live now. But what, what do you think we need to do by way of literacy of the legislative side of the uh, cyber response? We need to do more education, have some hearings around what the, the growing threat around cyber attacks uh, are. Mm. And, and on the Energy and Commerce Committee, we're at the forefront of energy, healthcare, right. more attacks uh, on healthcare, hospital systems, medical records, telecommunications, technology. Uh, and I believe that it's important that we address it sector by sector, where the experts, uh, those that are at, on the front lines, uh, have the opportunity to come in and tell us what, they, what they're experiencing. Mm and what they believe. And this will be a big priority for you yes. and, your, and your folks. It's our, it's our future. Thank you very much. Let me open the floor. Questions from the floor? OK, right here. Oh. Oop, uh, Cam, Kami Butt. All right. right. Kami, make it good. Uh, yes, Congresswoman, uh, I'm from Pakistan, and the largest dam in Pakistan, Mangla and Tarbela Dam, they were built by American dollars, basically, like 40, 50 years ago. So Democrat blamed that Republicans don't want investment in the country. 
uh, your hesitation and your saying that it costs so much and it takes so long, does it justify Democrat argument that Republicans don't want to invest in their own country? Thanks. Well, the Republicans would very much like to invest. Uh, the Republicans. They talk about deficits and they Well, the Republicans believe that money alone will not solve these problems, uh, that we have to address the permitting side of, of projects. Um, so the, the Republicans believe that if we are going to mine, if we're going to manufacture, if we're going to invest in uh, infrastructure, transmission, you name it, we have to address the permitting and the regulatory climate in this country right. that is that is hampering us from doing anything. It takes years. I just mentioned a hydro project, 10 years on average to relicense a project. Uh, you know, it's decades for, you know, so the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was established in 1975. We have not permitted a where, single, yeah. a single yeah. plant from start to finish since 1975 in the United States of America, okay? Highway projects on average, seven years, any federal dollars, seven years to permit a, a federal high, highway project. The Republicans believe that we we can and we must do better. And it's not about lowering standards. It is about actually getting, putting the money in the most efficient way to actually get projects completed that we're spending years and, uh, you know, well, lots since, and lots since you're, of money. You're, you're talking right. about fiscal mm -hmm. responsibility and fiscal, you, where are you on this upcoming question, which we'll have to deal with in this next year on debt ceiling, and what sort of terms should we have about raising debt ceiling, and, and should there be commitments made on you know, significant large tectonic reductions in other forms of spending? Stay tuned. <laughs> debt ceiling. There, Is it going to be fun? It's going to be fun. It's going to keep me up it's late? Gonna, it's going to keep you on the edge okay. of your seat. But I, I do want to mention, yeah. You know, I, I think yeah. maybe pivoting from debt ceiling to um, back, to, I'll just point out the CHIPS bill. Yeah. The CHIPS bill that was passed. And I. And you supported that. I, I did not in the oh, end. Okay. because And I had supported a, 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 sm a smaller version of it. Right. But anyway, but there was no changes to the permitting, the regulatory climate in this country. And now what are they facing? What are they coming and telling us? The very people, the investors who want to get these plants in the United States is that right. uh, we need some we need some exemptions from the permitting requirements because it's going to take too many years to get these plants built. So that's that's where. And had yes. you anticipated that problem yes. when you opposed the bill? You were worried oh, that we yes. would have and that I problem? Yes, and I'd had several conversations wow. with Secretary Raimondo, Commerce Secretary, and she she was she's was going to work right. on that. She she recognizes that we need to address the permitting, and I and I want to work with her further. But again, that was a it it was a missed opera. It, it is an example where just throwing more money at a problem isn't going to to solve it unless we address And there was so much demand to get that Chips Act through that it would have been an opportunity to potentially absolutely. Uh, we have one last question. Okay. Question right here. Uh, th thank you, Congressman uh, Blake Johnson with the Bipartisan Policy Center. You mentioned that um, conservatives are always worried about the, the amount of time it takes to get these yes. plants built and everything else. Senator uh, McConnell mentioned the transmission issue was one of the key things yes. as to why they weren't going to participate. That's a state's issue. Yes. Um, that also takes a lot of time yes. to right. coordinate. How will you address that issue? We're going to have to go to work on it. Okay. So, I and I don't have, I, I know that that is one of the big uh, questions that needs to be answered, um, but there are so, there were I think legitimate concerns raised by the states that would be impacted in the in the in the current proposal around the permitting reforms on transmission that the states uh, you know some states would benefit some states wouldn't and cost and such so we'll we'll have to look at that closer but the goal is going to be to address the time uh, that it takes and to get some permitting reform that is desperately needed in our country. So we hope you stay warm during your holidays in Spokane and in in, in your district that's uh, below 32 degrees out there and that you send pictures because some yes. of us really like snow. Oh, I do too. Uh, and, I do too. You know, I'm okay, going to go skiing. I'll yeah, send, so you send, send some, some photos of the snow. Spokane. 
and, right. and stay warm. And yes. I just want to thank you so much for your candor this morning. The incoming uh, chair of the Energy Commerce, uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, Kathy Morris Rogers. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank really you. great. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. That brings us to the end of our program this morning. On behalf of the Hill and the Bipartisan Policy Center, we'd like to thank everyone who joined us here today, whether you're in the room or online. If you missed any portion of today's discussion, the full event video will be available on thehill.com shortly. Um, if you're here in person, we're not kicking you out. We have a lunch spread out here. I invite you to stay and enjoy. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.